today we're going to be talking about cities. And cities is interesting because, you know, just a, about 100 years ago, we only had 200 million people living in cities. Today, we got about 3.5 billion. And by 2050, we're going to have 7 billion. So all of these experiences that we've been learning today, we need to see how to apply it over the next 35 years. So we need to decide how is it that we want to live? How is it that we want to do our cities? And there have been some successes. For example, with water. And now there is a conference here in Sweden about water. Water, for us, is simple. We open and we get water. But the reality is that 25 years ago, we had 4 billion people that had clean drinking, safe drinking water. Today, we got about 6 billion. So we said, wow, it's nice. We went from 4 to 6 billion. However, we also need to recognize that we still have about 1.2 billion people that do not have access to clean water. And even if we're talking about access to sanitation, to sewage, we still got 2.6 billion. One out of three people on earth do not have access to sewage and sanitation. But let's turn it to something else. Another big trend that is happening now, a positive one. We are living longer. Much, much longer. Everywhere is what I call the new 65. You know the people that have ever in the history of humanity lived to 65 years old? Half are alive today. Half. This is something that is quite new. Actually, 180 years ago, we didn't have any. All of these circles are the countries of the world, and here's the life expectancy. 180 years ago, we didn't have any country in the world that had a life expectancy above 45. Today, we don't have any that has a life expectancy below 45. It's incredible. Actually, I say people are not retiring. People are rehiring. People are doing other activities. Actually, I think the biggest waste of resource that we have in the world today are the older adults. In most of the countries, the people retire at 60 or whatever, and we cross them out as if they had died, except, except that they got 20, 30, 40 years left, and they are healthier and wealthier and more educated and more traveled, and they could be fantastic people that could be Providing volunteering with the city, organizing Tai Chi in the parks, teaching English to the immigrants. It could be great resource. The population of 65 is going to double, and the population of 80 is going to quadruple by 2050. It's interesting. Actually, here in Sweden, just 150 years ago, the life expectancy was 45. So many in this room would be dead by now. <laughs> Now, almost doubled in just 150 years. It's very clear that we have learned how to survive. But when we have issues such as climate change and public health crisis and economic crisis and so on, it's clear that we need to learn how to live. And I thank Frederick and all the organizers because this conference, more than anything else, is about learning how to live. And we can all can learn from each other. So we got to think, what role are we going to play? The public sector, the private sector, the NGOs, because a lot of this is about the built environment. So not only do we got to improve the cities that we have today, but we got to create great cities for many, many people, for older adults, for people all over the world. We got to create cities for people. So it's quite exciting to be here at this conference where this year the theme is about the sense of home. And I've been able to hear today com uh, presentations on immigrants. I live in Canada, and in Canada, I live in Toronto. In Toronto, more than one out of two people, we were born in another country. Huge. So more than half of the people were first-generation immigrants. So let me tell you a little bit about some of those sense of home. So first, I'm going to talk about vibrant cities and healthy communities and happier people. But I want to make a special emphasis on equity and public health. But to put this into context, first, I'm going to talk about Bogota and 880 cities. And then I want to end with eight messages on creating a sense of home. Why Bogota? Bogota, because I will live there in my previous life. 
uh, obviously is not the ideal city. Obviously, it's many decades behind any city in Sweden. However, I learned that it's not about the money. When I go to many cities around the world, people say, oh, we cannot do this because we don't have the money. It's not about the money. And also, I, now I advise many cities, but before, I was doing, not advising. For example, in these six years, between 95 and 2000, we built over 800 parks. All over the place, we built parks all over the city. Talking about sense of place. The parks give you a lot of that sense of place. For example, here, the Pope came here, gave a mass for a million people, and then he left, and almost nothing happened for 27 years. The city put a wire fence around. No one could go in. There were not even sidewalks or anything. Why nothing happened? Because sometimes it's hard to change. Sometimes it's hard to change. Because when you try to change, sometimes some people show up. The cave people show up. <laughs> Who are the cave people? They are the citizens against virtually everything. <laughs> so you, when you try to do things, and if you try to over ask people over, you know, it's, it's complicated. But I also learned that the citizens pay us every other week is to get things done. Not to have too many excuses why things cannot be done. So each one of us has to become a champion at finding solutions to the problems. Not at finding problems to the solution. So then for 27 years it was like this, not even sidewalks or anything. And then in four years we turned it into the nicest park for recreation, for sports, for culture, for active recreation, for passive recreation, for all kinds of activities. By the way, the uses and the activities are so critical. That is what really makes parks successful. It's not only the design and the construction, but maybe more important than the design and the construction is the uses, is the activities. I find that in most cities it's easier to find the millions to build the parks than to find the thousands to make it work. We need to have those thousands to do the movie night, to do the bus festival, to do the different activities. They are those activities, the ones that are going to develop that sense of place. And like Colin was saying, maybe it's on the back of our minds. Things that had happened there when we were little kids. But it's those uses and those... And of course, it's not only just about big parks. We also got to do small parks. We need to have neighborhood parks and pocket parks. We did over 750 neighborhood parks in six years. All over the city. And people say, why should we do small parks or big parks? Well, we, unfortunately, we need to do both. Because they satisfy very different needs. In the small neighborhood park, that's where we develop that sense of belonging. Actually, even more sense of home in the neighborhood park. That's where we meet the parents of our children's friends. That's also where we develop a sense of solidarity so the neighborhoods become safer. Because if something is happening in our neighborhood and we know the neighbors, we go out to help. If we don't know anybody, we close the door and stay inside. We also did something that is really interesting is the Ciclovia. What is the Ciclovia? I found a small program and turned it into the world's largest pop-up park. Sundays, we pop it up, and people come out. They walk, they bike, they skate, they run. Here, the different colors are the different income levels, and I thought that in Latin America, where we have the biggest gap between the haves and the have-nots in the world, it was very important to connect everybody, the haves and the have-nots, as well as connecting all of the major parks in the city. How do we do it? It's pretty simple. We open streets to people, and we close them to cars, and the magic happens, and people come out. And they walk, and they bike, and more than anything, they enjoy the presence of each other. That's part of this, that sense of home. People could be walking around the neighborhood, people could be, but they come to the open, in North America, we call it open streets, in Colombia, Ciclovia. Why do they come? Because they want to be with others. And along the road, since not everybody wants to walk or bike or skate, then on the public places on the road, we do aerobics and Tai Chi and Cha 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 and any other activity. And this is really, truly great. Who comes? Everybody. All we you really need is two feet and a heartbeat. And then you enjoy it. And then people come out. And it, this is something that is really wonderful. The young, the old, the rich, the poor, the fat, the skinny. Every Sunday of the year, we get more than one and a half million people. 
more than one of you and half million people walking and cycling and running and skating and enjoying each other. And this is nice because it, it opens us minds. All of the sudden people say, oh, the streets, they're public space. Maybe we can use the streets at different uses according to the time of the day, the day of the week, the week of the year. And it's been like a positive virus. Now the city of angels, that is also the city of cars, is doing their own Ciclavia. And we see Portland. And we see cities of all. I've seen it work in cities of 10,000 people, 100,000, 20 million like Mexico. We see it in New York. This is San Jose, 50,000 cars on a Friday. Only people walking and cycling on a Sunday. Paris is doing it. It's something that is really great. Why do I think this is important? Because this is about social integration. More than, it's not a recreation program. Recreation is the excuse. More than anything is because this is about social integration. This is the only place in that city and in most cities that we meet each other as equals. I heard after lunch the speaker from Syria talking about her experiences, how some neighborhoods were nice and some were not nice, some were pretty and some were not pretty. All of a sudden here, everybody's equal. The wealthiest people of the city and the poorest people of the city and their spouses and their children meet as equals. Some might have a $5,000 bicycle, some might have a $50 bike, but they are just as happy. Some might have an original Nike shirt, some might have a fake, but they're just as happy. And meeting each other as equal is something that is very important to develop that sense of home in the city, wide in the neighborhood, from the home to the neighborhood to the city to the country. It's great. We also built 280 kilometers of protected bikeways in three years and went from 28,000 to about half a million people all over the city, creating a network. And it's something that is very important also creating that network in some of the places that we did it. It's so poor that here in beautiful Sweden, it's almost impossible for you to imagine the level of poverty. But look how some of these neighborhoods were transformed. By the way, that, why do we need good quality sidewalks, good quality bikeways? Part of it is because it's going to be safer, but just as important is because to dignify. We need to dignify the cyclists. We need to dignify the pedestrians. And that is almost as important as the safety itself. By the way, to, to this afternoon when I'm talking about walking, I'm talking about anybody that moves at the speed of the pedestrian. Now, I run two organizations. One is called 880 Cities, and one is called the World Urban Parks. And I've been lucky to have worked in over 200 different cities all over the world. A few cities in Sweden. Uh, and World Urban Parks, I hope that you go to our website, join the city, the people, individuals. It's basically our goal is how to have a world where people value and have access to quality urban parks. And we have members all over, and that is the website. We have our conference in South Africa next month and then in Minneapolis next year. And also, when I go, people always ask, Miguel, what is this 880 cities? 880 cities, well, 880 cities is not about walking or cycling. It's not about par parks and streets and public places. Those are the means, not the end. The end is how can we have some successful cities? How can we help develop healthy communities? That is the idea, having successful cities and healthy communities where people are going to be happier enjoying their parks, their public places. And wherever I go, people always say, Gil, is this intersection safe? Can my children walk to school? Can my grandparents walk to get eggs or milk or to take public transit? I said, look, you, you don't have to be a transportation engineer. Three simple steps. We call it the editing rule of common sense. Unfortunately, common sense seems to be the least common of the senses. Step number one, think of a child. Someone that you love, someone around eight years old, your sons, your daughter, your grandchildren, even if they're playing Pokemon in Stockholm. <laughs> Actually, they're playing Pokemon all over the world. That's interesting. And we can talk about that and the sense of home of Pokemons. And once you have that eight-year-old in mind, then step number two, think of an 80-year-old that you also love. It can be your parents, your grandparents, your brothers, your sisters. And when you have the child and you have the older adult, step number three, would you send them across that intersection? Would you send them walking to get eggs or milk? Would you send them on a bike to the park? If you would, would they feel safe? If you would, it's because it's safe. 
If you would not, it's because it's not, and we need to do it better. What if everything that we did in Sweden, the sidewalk, the crosswalk, the street, the park, the school, the community center, everything had to be great for an 8 and an 80. It's not 8 to 80, because some people complain, oh, but what about the 5-year-old? No, it's 8 and 80 as an indicator species. Because if it's good for the 8 and it's good for the 80, it's going to be good for everybody from 0 to over 100. We need to start building cities as if everybody was 30-year-old and athletic. And we need to build great cities for all. That is the concept of 880 cities. But we got to do it fast. We got to do it fast. There is kind of like a sense of urgency. We got climate change and the symptoms are everywhere. Also, we said the population is growing in Sweden, in Stockholm. You know, we're getting older. The life expectancy, we just mentioned that it has increased and the population is growing. Stockholm is the fastest growing city in Europe. And like Einstein said, we cannot solve the problems by using the same kind of thinking that we use when we created them. So let me take you through eight messages related to the sense of home. The first one is that change is hard. Change is hard. But it's doable. It's doable. Maybe we need to have reminders of how we were before, but change is hard. I know that just doing more of the same is easier, especially for politicians thinking on elections. But look, my friend Jan Gell, he said that in Copenhagen, they didn't have any pedestrian streets. The cars were also taking over Copenhagen in the 50s, in the 60s. When they were going to create the first pedestrian street, people said, what? A street where people are going to walk pedestrian street? We have too many cars. And the weather is horrible. It's cold in the winter. It's hot in the summer. It rains all year round. But the number one reason why they didn't want any pedestrian streets is they said, oh, that's not part of our culture. You know, pedestrian, that's for the Italians. <laughs> because the Italians are loud and noisy and they like to be on the streets. But we are Danish and we are shy and we are cold and we don't go out. Let me tell you, the Danish now, they are more Italian than the Italians. They love their pedestrian streets in the sun, in the rain. This is City Hall in Copenhagen. They went from car invasion to people places. More than 18 of those parking lots were turned into people places. Their pedestrian streets are very successful in the winter. They're successful in the summer. And now people are walking and people are cycling. And it has totally transformed. But part of the change, let me give you three suggestions. First, change is not unanimous. So when you are trying to do things and you say, oh, but there is some concern, not everybody's on board. No, never. When, if you really want everybody to be on board, you have to water down change so much that it's not going to be changed any longer. Two, the general interest must prevail over the particular. So it's not, oh, I don't want to do this bike way because it's my store. No, 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 don't tell me about your store. Tell me why this is not good or this is good for the general interest. And three, Anytime that you say no to something, you are saying yes to something else. So if you say, okay, we don't want to have this bikeway here. Okay, that's fine. But then you are saying, we're going to have more cars, and we're going to have more pollution, and we're going to have more obesity, and we're going to have so on. So when you say no to something, you are saying yes to something else. It's not that when you say no to something, it doesn't have any other implications. And wonderful countries that have wonderful cities like Sweden. Please, no complacency, no complacency. Of course, you have many great cities. I mean, take any city in Sweden. If you want to look for cities that are worse than you, in five minutes, you do a list of a 1,000 cities. But if you compare yourself with cities that are worse than you, eventually, you're going to look like those. So only benchmark yourself with the cities that are best. Say, OK, according to the size of my city, whether it's Uppsala or it's, uh, uh, Stockholm or whatever, whatever city, how, what other cities in the world have good quality? Which one has the best parks, or the best walkability, or the best sense of home, or the best whatever you want? And then compare yourself with those. And the good cities keep improving. For example, I was talking about cycling. Copenhagen. Copenhagen is a great city for cycling. And people bike there all year round. Actually, 41, 41 out of 100 trips are done cycling. But they said, it doesn't matter that we have the highest percentage of any big city in the world. Now we want to go to 50%. And they are increasing the 50%. They had this old bike share that were not. Now they got these new ones with GPS and all of this. They are widening the protected bikeways. They are building new ones, always separating. 
building new bridges, creating all the traffic lights at the speed of the cyclists, making sure that walking, cycling, and transit has a really good connection. Another great city, Barcelona. Barcelona is a very walkable city. Look at this density, all five and six and seven story buildings. Actually, the nicest cities in the world are pretty flat, five, six, seven stories. Very dense, but not with 40 story buildings. And two months ago, maybe even less than two months ago, you know, they decided we're going to increase the walkability. Not by 2%, not by 5 by 60%. 60%. What they're going to do is every other street, they're going to use it for cars. The two in the middle for pedestrians. Imagine, this is really bold. Good cities being even better. So everyone in Sweden, make sure that, of course, you are good. But you really got to continue moving, no complacency. You got to move from good to great. And by the way, the, the height of the buildings is something that is very, very important because people say, oh, what is the density? Should we have five story or 20 story? Well, that is really about sense of place. And Colin mentioned young girl. One of the things that they've studied a lot is when you are above the seven, eighth story, you start having more in common with the birds and the planes than with people. So you can have the same density. 10 different ways, either 40-story building every other block or five-story buildings next to each other. So this is very important. For example, I've seen some beautiful neighborhoods here in Stockholm, next door. But then I'm getting a little bit worried when I see some of these buildings, that when you have four or five, all of a sudden you got 25 or 30. So how is it that you're going to grow? But I know that change is hard, but change is doable. I know that some of you are already thinking, oh, Gil, you know, here in Sweden we're different. We got nothing in common with New York or Copenhagen or Bogota. I know. We, you are unique. You are unique. Always remember that you are absolutely unique, just like everyone else. <laughs> you know, this is not like on the computer that we copy and paste. Every city is different. Every neighborhood is different. Every street is different. So it's not about copy and paste, but it is about how to adapt and improve. Every image that I'm showing is, can be adapted to any city if we have an open mind. Okay, seven. Equity is very important. Also, I just heard a presentation from a professor from Syria. And this morning, and th all of this is also about equity. And next year, the theme is also going to be about economic impact. I'm talking about equity, not equality. The other day I saw a cartoon that was very appropriate. It said, this is equality. No, this is not what we need. Some people are so far behind that some people only need two or three boxes, while others don't need any box. So it's about equality. And we go to any city in the world, we should evaluate citizens and how well we're treating the most vulnerable citizens, the children, the older adults, and the poor. And in many places, we're not doing a very good job. Three weeks ago, I was in the work in the U.S. In the U.S., they have one out of five children are under poverty. You go to cities where, what does it look like? In some places of the city, you got about one acre per 90,000 people. In the other place, you have five acres. So geographical equity has become so critical. And many people want to do their city like in the U.S. I mean, the U.S. has many good things, but look at this. In the cities, I was working in Cleveland. If you live in this part of Cleveland, your life expectancy is 64. If you live in this one, your life expectancy is 90. And I'm sure that if you live in this one, and I've walked those neighborhoods, they look a lot like they were described by the person that spoke after lunch. They were not nice. They were horrible. They don't even have a grocery store. Even if you want to buy vegetables, they don't have a grocery store. They got five times as many convenience stores. They don't have parks, and the ones that have are in horrible conditions. The sidewalks are full of cracks, the crosswalks. And it's not because it's Cleveland. You go to Washington, and it's the same. You go to New Orleans, and it's the same. So the issue of equity is important. And Sweden has always been a model that is one of the most equitable countries. Actually, according to OECD, here's where Sweden is. And you're going to be in a lot better company on this side than if you move on this side. So this is something to keep in mind. Also, mobility. Mobility is something. Also, we heard about the issue of the cars. The reality is that people that have a car, they're spending one out of four dollars or kronas or whatever you want. One out of four on mobility when they have a car, when they could be spending only 5% if they use public transit, walk and bike. 
So there is nothing that the governments can do that improve more the income of the family than if you can downsize from two cars to one or from one to zero. Nothing. Instead of spending 25%, you're going to spend only five. So you're like winning the lottery. Now you're going to have 20% to go backpacking in Australia or to have a condo in a walkable neighborhood. And it's going to be great for the economy, for the community, because what do you do if you have 20% more? You're going to go to the restaurants. You are going to improve your basement. You're going to improve your house. So instead of buying cars built in China or Mexico, you're going to spend it in the local economy. Six, sidewalks, bikeways, parks, public places. Are they important? It's not so obvious. It's not so obvious. I go to many cities, and I show them these sidewalks or these playgrounds. And you know what the mayors and councillors and city staff say? G say, Gil, go do some fundraising. But when I go to the same municipality and I show him a pothole on the street, <gasps> they go crazy about potholes. Maybe they think that a car is going to fall there. <laughs> and the media, media goes crazy. TV station hired this woman. All she does goes and measures potholes and has a section on the news Tuesdays and Fridays. And the citizens, they get organized to complain not about the playgrounds, not about the sidewalks, about the pothole. And when they take care of it, elected officials and media and everyone, they go and celebrate. So then you say, why so much celebration about one pothole? Maybe it's because when we take a look at our cities from the air, the biggest public space are the streets. And by public is what belongs to all of us, rich or poor, young or old, everybody. The streets actually are between 20 and 40% of our cities. 20 and 40 percent. And if you take out the private homes, the streets are between 70 and 90 percent of what belongs to all of us, whatever is public. So we need to decide how do you develop, how to use that public space to develop that sense of home. Here, let me tell you, in Oros, there used to be a river going through here 40 years ago, but 40 years ago was about efficiency. So then they build a road on top of it. This is very, very important because any city in Sweden or anywhere in the world is going to be successful if it attracts good people. It's not about quantity, it's about quality. We live in an ever more globalized world, and in a globalized world, the best people can live anywhere. However you define best, they can be the best medical doctors, the best musicians, the best uh, carpenters, uh, coffee makers, anything. If I'm a really fantastic pizza maker, I can live anywhere in the world. So where am I gonna live? Whatever me and my spouse and my children have the best quality of life. So someone said, can we attract the best people from Sweden to come and live here? Probably not. So someone said, wasn't there a river going down? And that was eight years ago. They brought it out. So would you want to live in this city or in this one? This is very, very important. The quality of life. This develops a lot of sense of place. Imagine from the sense of home, the people that live here and here before they build this road, Kind of like with a machete or something breaking up that city. Or what, are we going to do streets for people? Do we want our streets to look like car storage? Or actually to help build a sense of home, to build community? It's very different. It's about how do we want to live? We dream that this is how we want to live, and then we go out and build this. <laughs> we are not consistent. This is all of Florence, Italy, and one highway intersection in Atlanta. Five, play. We need to play everywhere. In Sweden, everywhere we need to play. Imagine you're going to take public transit and you have a swing. Or you have a place to play with your kids, a small parquet. So all of this is about having a fun city, about having an interesting city. And play is very important. Play, because sometimes people think, oh, that's fun and games. No, it's fun and games, but it's much more. For children, playing, that's what the children learn. Playing is how children develop their muscle strength. That's where they develop their cognitive thinking, their coordination, their language capacity. So that is where they develop that sense of home, that sense of place, that sense of belonging. It's absolutely critical to have play everywhere. Not only the schools, not only the parks, everywhere. When we go to work, when we go to anywhere, Imagine, not only in Sweden, but all over the world, we had a goal that every child should have a park or a play area within 500 meters. Every child. That would be great. By 2020, not in 40 years, it's totally doable. 
We can have and start doing parks all over the place. And let's do the measurements. Actually, New York did this. New York, six years ago, they measured and they realized that many people did not have a park within walking distance. So they said, what are we going to do if we don't have a park within walking distance? They said, okay, let's do what belongs to all of us. The street, the sidewalk, the library, city hall, everything. For example, they saw there were many schools that had this horrible thing they call playground which is nothing. This is just a bunch of pavement with a couple of basketball courts. So they went to the schools and said, we improve, we're going to invest here in the playground and make it really nice if and only if you open it to the community after 4 p.m. and Saturdays and Sundays. So this is become a school park, and they turned it into this. Not one or two, 221 of these. 221. And playing in green spaces, it reduces the attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. Imagine that that was the school near your neighborhood and all of the sun is turning to this with green roofs. Here they have a community garden and they got this park specific takes up over 55,000 gallons of water per year. And if you don't have schools, then we can take over a street. We realize that the streets are 30, 40 percent of our city. Let's take over a street and let's make it a play area. So we got to think, what role are we going to play? Four, walk, walk. Who came walking today? Raise your hand if you walked here. It's like 2%. No, you know, actually, I don't see any cars in this room. I don't see any buses or bikes. Everybody walked today. Everybody. Every single trip begins and ends by walking. We are all pedestrians. That's how we get around. You know, it's a... That's how we were created. Just like the birds, they fly, or the fish swims, or the deer runs. People, we walk, we walk. Everybody walks, and when we walk, we're so happy. We walk, and all of a sudden, we see the children playing, and we hear the birds singing. We go in front of a coffee shop, and we smell the aroma of the coffee. We use all the senses, and that makes us happy. Everywhere, we walk in the summer in Rio, or in the winter in Canada. So walking is something that is absolutely everybody. But we need to make it safe. We need to make it safe. Yesterday, yesterday, people driving cars killed 741 people walking. That's more than one person every less than two minutes. One person. That's totally uncivilized. Imagine that there is a plane flying over Sweden, and another one over the US, and another one over Russia, another one over Australia, another one over Bra uh, Brazil, and they crashed, and everybody dies. Five planes today, five planes tomorrow, five planes the next day. That's how many people walking are killed every day. The equivalent of five planes full of people. They are not accidents. They are incidents. That's why I love the leadership that Sweden has taken on Vision Zero. Because now lots of cities around the world are saying, we need to learn from this experience of Vision Zero and we need to eliminate. And people are saying, you want to improve walking. First, the pedestrians have to become a priority. This is how we build the cities. This doesn't give a sense of home to anybody. The, the sidewalk is the most democratic place of any city. And we are allowing the cars to be there. We're telling this woman, you are a second class citizen. When we have money to do four or six lanes for cars and we don't even have money to do a sidewalk. If we're going to improve walkability, we've got to reduce the speed. And this is something the world is learning from Sweden. 30K an hour in all the residential areas, not in front of the schools, everywhere. Because if you get hit by a car at 30, only 5% probability of being killed. If you get hit at 50, it's going to be over 85. And there are many, many studies that show exactly the same results. So we've got to improve this. Simple things, so that's having a small island in a crosswalk, we eliminate more than half of those incidents. Why are we still doing crosswalks without an island? When we know that the kids are going to go on a field trip, they, not all of them cross, so they can wait in the middle. And the older adults are especially vulnerable. Older adults are killed twice as many in intersections as the proportion of the population. So we need to change this. Three, but it's not only about walking. It's all other modes of sustainable mobility. Walking, cycling, and public transit, they're going to be best friends. I'm not saying that this is the end of the car era, but the way we use cars is very, very, very different, and it's changing very, very fast. In the U.S. and Canada, in the last four years, 
Fewer people between 16 and 24 have purchased cars than in the last 40. Fewer people have even gotten driver's license. All of the sudden, for the young people, a car is not a status symbol. It's much more of a status symbol an iPad or living in a walkable neighborhood or getting a backpack and going to India. Actually, in many places, I said, we're living longer. Many older adults are terrified that when they lose their driver's license, in the U.S. is more than 600,000 every year. Actually, a doctor in Canada studied this and found that the older adult losing their driver's license has a similar impact as when they are told that they are diagnosed with cancer. It's not because they love cars. It's because they love mobility. People want to age in place. They want to continue shopping in the same stores. They want to continue visiting the same friends. That is that sense of home. They don't want to be taken out. So that sense of home is critical, and part of it is mobility. Part of it is also how to deal with isolation. Sometimes people are solitary in the middle of millions. So how to develop those public places for people to go out? And now people say, oh, but no worry, the driverless cars. Well, if we don't change our behavior, this is what cities look like with, without driverless cars, and this is how they're going to look like with driverless cars. There's not going to be any difference. Actually, those people that are losing their driver's license when they are 70 or 80, now they're going to continue using cars because they're not driving it themselves. And of course, we got to improve how to ride bicycles. I mean, walking and cycling is not a frivolity. Especially when I go to developing countries, they say, oh, why do you want us to stay poor? No, walking and cycling is not a joke. Walking and cycling is the only individual mode of mobility for most people. Walking and cycling is the only individual mobility for all children and youth. You might live in the wealthiest neighborhood of Sweden. If you're under 16, your only individual mode of mobility is to walk or bike. So walking and cycling safe should be a right, like a human right, the right to safe and enjoyable mobility. Unless you think that only the people that have the age and the money and the desire to drive a car have a right to individual mobility. That's why I'm talking about democracy and human rights and equality and sustainability, because everything is linked to everything. If we're going to prove bikeability, well, it's not we tried in Toronto doing some things that don't work. We just put up signs, we paint on the street, it doesn't work, or signs, or bicycle parking, or lockers, or maps. Nothing like that works. We even try to, because the cars don't respect the painted line anywhere in the world. We even get public bikes, bike sharing. But if we do that before having the infrastructure, it's like getting the saddle before the horse. It doesn't work. The only two things that really increase cyclists is lowering the speed in the neighborhoods. All residential areas have to be 30K or less. And number two, developing a network of protected bikeways, bikeways that have a physical separation with the cars. And then things are going to click. And that is what's starting to happen. This is Paris. This is San Francisco. It's starting to happen all over the place. And it's, but you need a grid. You need to connect origins and destinations. This is Copenhagen. All the neighbors, 30K. But all the arterials have protected bikes. It's at one level for the cars, five centimeters higher for the bikes, five centimeters higher for the pedestrian. And then just like we have a power grid or a water grid, we need to have a bicycle grid. Owns. Owns in Denmark, which is 200,000 people, medium-sized city. They did a sustainable mobility plan. Talk about developing a sense of home. They involve everybody, walking, cycling, cars. The winter, the summer, people going to work, people going to study. Everywhere where there's more than 5,000 cars, they put a physically separated bikeway in order to make it safe for everyone. Counters so that you know how many people. At midnight, it goes to zero. So when I took this photo, 7,803 people had gone by, places to put air and nice signage and lockers. All of this, bicycle parking. I mean, all of these amenities improve the quality of cycling to the people that are already cycling. So if you only got 2%, it's going to improve for that 2%. If you got 30%, it's going to improve for those. But this, making walkable street, look, owns. Pedestrians are priority. So if you're on a bike, either you walk your bike or you leave your bike out. And then I was saying, you know, lowering the speed. In many cities around the world, they have 30K in front of the schools. Why in front of the schools? Because it works. But do we want children to be safe only in front of the school? or everywhere. And actually, it owns the speed in front of the school. It's not 30K. It's 0K. 0K. Why zero? No cars between 7 a.m. and 4 p.m., except the people that live in front of the school. Then they even put some ping pong tables and games so that the children are happy to arrive early to school. 
and it's nice for the eight, and it's nice for the 80, and it's not a really city that is developing that sense of home. And if we're going to promote public transit, because I said walking, cycling, and public transit, one of my brothers is mayor of Bogota, and he says that a civilized city is not the one where the poor have cars. It's the one where the rich use public transit. So we really need to have good quality public transit so that everybody, poor and rich, Actually, I was in Malmo with the mayor of Malmo, and he said, Gil, you know, people didn't want these buses because they got a mental thing with the buses. So he said, you know, Gil, what we did with the buses? We put a nose, we covered the wheels, and now they look like trains. <laughs> Part of it is a psychological issue, a mental issue. And I'm so envious. I was in Osolan here when I was at SLU and they got so many, you, you got such wonderful public transit in so many cities, big and small. Last month I was at Yale University training 30 mayors from China. And you know, China, the, the economy is doing well. So when the economy does well, you improve entertainment and health and uh, education. One thing that doesn't improve is mobility when it's based on the car. So, this is, so fortunately, one of the mayors from Wangzhou said, Gil, you know, in our city, we were getting suffocated by cars. So then what we did, we did a bus rapid transit. And now this bus rapid transit in Wangsu moves more people than all of the subway lines in China, except line number two in Beijing. It's, a, it's about also the details. The other day a mayor said, Gil, you know, everybody's gonna get out on these buses because we do buses that are big and tall. I said, you think anybody's gonna get out on those buses when this is what the bus stop looks like? And then I showed my school, 1,500 students in this school, and this is the bus stop. So I decided to show that mayor another bus stop. And he said, Gil, why are you showing me this bus stop? I said, maybe this is what the bus stop would look like if the decision makers use the bus service. Number two, we got to ask the citizens. The, the citizens are the experts. The citizen engagement is critical. We honestly have to listen to the citizens. If we're going to do a park, and I ask my daughter, what are we going to do in this park? She's going to say, oh, dad, let's do some yoga. And in that other park, let's do more yoga. And in that one, I say, no, daughter, not everybody wants to do yoga in the park. Some people want to have a fire pit. Others want to have a pizza oven. Others want to paint, others want to run, others want to take photos, others want to just go on skateboarding. So let's listen to the citizens because they always have wonderful ideas. So any project sh should start by asking the, the citizen needs to be involved before, during, and after. And one, benefits. Let's start working on the benefits. If we're going to promote walkability or sense of home, let's start with the benefits. It's good for the environment, it's good for the economic activity, it's good for recreation, it's good for transportation, it's good for health. For example, I'm just going to give you one example. Health. Is this what the future looks like? All over the world, the issue of obesity is not how people look, but that it has to do with heart attacks and respiratory problems. In Sweden now, it's almost one in five. Of course, it's much lower than the rest of the countries around the world, even than the rest of the countries in, in Europe. But, but remember, you got to benchmark always with the best. And we got to work on both sides of the balance. Calories in, calories out. We got to improve the school lunches. We got to have farmers markets all over the city. We got to have gardens in the schools, in the parks, everywhere so the children learn that the tomatoes don't come out of a factory, but that they are grown. And if we're active, active is like a wonder drug. And it's not about doing marathons. Children, 60 minutes a day. Adults, 30 minutes a day. That's all you really need to do. The head of the CDC says physical activity is the wonder drug. And no better place, an easier place to do it than in the sidewalks, in the parks, in the streets. But let's keep in mind that walking and cycling and parks, all of this improves physical activity. Physical health, sorry. Physical health. But there is no health without mental health. So we got to think about mental health. Depression today is the world's leading cause of disability. If we have contact with nature, and Colin did present some fantastic numbers, it improves the mood and the cognitive attention. So we got to work on that. More, more green in the neighborhoods is going to lower depression, the anxiety, the stress. Actually, this is the neighborhood where I live in, in Toronto, which has lots of green spaces all over the place, which is quite nice. And I know that Frederick's standing up, but here it says 121, so I'm going to finish in 121. Shirinjoku in Japan. What is Shirinjoku? All of the sudden people are going to the forest, are going to the parks. Shirinjoku is forest bathing. Two consecutive days and you all, all of the sudden you got 50% more anti-cancer cells. So Sala in Sweden in the campus, 
of SLU. So these are the, so I just want to end by saying we have some challenges. But more than challenges, we got wonderful opportunities. But if we define our city around cars, all we're going to get is more cars. And then we're going to have to invite our friends to help us cross the street. <laughs> And what do we do? We build more roads. If we are going to solve the issue of traffic congestion to building more roads. There is no city in the world that has all the issue of mobility to building more roads. But never that, even cities that are nice, like, for example, uh, Milan, Milano, you know, it used to be nice. Now it's been <gasps> suffocated by cars. The cars are taking all over Milan. So it's not only just the big cities or the big highways, also small, street, uh, small streets, small cities. They used to have these wonderful pedestrian promenades. Now they are all full of cars. It doesn't make any sense. But if we build more roads trying to solve mobility, it's like trying to put out a fire using gasoline. <laughs> it doesn't work. It doesn't work. But if we define our city around people, we're going to get healthier and happier people. And that is the idea. How to get healthier and happier people all over the place, in the summer, in the winter, throughout the year, in the big cities, in the small cities, in the communities. How are we going to develop that sense of home for rich and poor, for young, for old? We got to think outside the box. These are not technical things. These are not financial things. They are political in the big sense, and everybody has to participate. We got to create a broad alliance. We got to invite everybody, the elected officials, the public sector staff, but not just the planners. We can invite public health and environment and economic. And also, we need to invite the community, the activists, the media, the universities, everybody. But we got to move from talking to doing. It's not about sustainable mobility. It's not about parks. It's about creating a vibrant, successful cities, about healthy communities where all people are going to live happier. I wish you much success. Thank you very much. <clears throat> <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for a fantastic energy boost at the end of the day. It's a sauna like conditions in here. Nobody's cold, I hope, which is our goal. Uh, we have to fix that to next year, I'm sorry. Um, well, anyone who wants to ask a question? Okay. Okay, you're all shocked about how easy. It seems to create the perfect uh, city. And that's actually my question to you, if I will start this, this questioning. It sounds so easy. It sounds so obvious. All these, why aren't these things happening all around the world without you and others having to stand like this to, to, to tell everyone that it has to happen? Because change is hard. You ask people, who wants change? Everybody raises their hand. And then you ask, who wants to change? Nobody raises their hand. Uh, because it's a lot more easy just to do more of the same. But how, nevertheless, we need to realize that the way we're doing, we're not doing very well. The issue of climate change is a reality everywhere. So we need to change how we move, how we build cities. We need to change this pro. Uh, I've done a lot of work in Mexico. Mexico, in the last 30 years, their cities, their top 100 cities, grew by two and a half times the population. And it's not that important if it's two and a half, it grows properly, but the population grow by two and a half times. The footprint grow 11 times. How are you going to have sustainability when you grow the footprint by 11 times? The water, the sewage, the water. So, so we need to change those things. So, but, but the important thing is that I think we need to have like a three-legged stool. One of the legs are elected officials. Another leg are the public sector. But as I said, not just planners or transportation. We need to get everybody, the public health, the environment, the fine. But the other leg are the citizens. The citizens can no longer be spectators. The citizens need to participate. Go to the public meetings, send emails to the public sector staff, to the elected officials, go to the public meetings, vote and put whatever governments they want. Because we, the city can no longer be spectators. They, they, they need to act. And I think that is important. We need to develop that sense of urgency. Okay. Anyone in the audience? Okay. Um, That's what happens when you are the last one on the agenda. <laughs> yes. People are tired. Even though I can still feel the energy in the room. Um, but I want to continue my questioning because one thing is that we don't want to change, or it's hard to change. But are there specific groups that come up to you after you've had your lectures and say, sounds terrific, but you know, 
That's not possible. Oh, it's totally possible. People are changing all over the world in many, many ways. I was talking about the 30K that people are actually looking at Sweden for inspiration. In Toronto, in, in the last two years, New York lowered their, tra their speed to, 20, to 25 miles an hour, which is 40 kilometers citywide. And any neighborhood can actually lower to, to uh, less 20 miles to 30K if they request it. So citywide, 40. Uh, Toronto, over 1 million people now live in 30K an hour. So many cities, public bicycles, only places like Copenhagen or, or Amsterdam had public bikes, but people say, oh, you know, those Vikings are so different. All of the southern Paris, Paris has Velib, 20,000 bikes, and now everybody. Now we got 800 cities around the world that have bike share. So people, sometimes people are changing. Uh, I think, but I think that if you want to change anything in Sweden, in a small city or a big city, uh, five elements, quick elements. One is develop a sense of urgency. You need to, New York, when Bloomberg was going to make change, he created this New York plan in YC 2030. Basically, he created a sense of urgency. He said, we're going to grow by one million. If we don't do something about it, we're going to collapse. And he created this sense of urgency. Sense of urgency. Two, political will. Political will is that the general interest must prevail. Three, you must have doers in the public sector, people that will not take no for an answer, that will look for the small crack in the window and will run through it. Four, we need leaders, not one or two leaders. We need hundreds of leaders. We need leaders in the schools. We need leaders in the business. We need leaders everywhere. And five, we need citizen engagement. We honestly have to listen to the citizens before, during, and after. So I think those five elements are critical to create a change. In some cities, might be more of one or more than the other. It's not that one is before the other. No, all five are important. But, 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 but I think that one of the ones that I think is most cr critical is that sense of urgency. If we don't develop that sense of urgency in many ways, we are like the little frog you know, that they put on the cold water and then turn on the heat and the frog hasn't realized that the water is warming up. And before the frog realizes that the water is warm, it's going to be cooked. <laughs> and we, in many ways, we're being cooked. Uh, so, so we need to develop that sense of urgency as if we were throwing the frog in a warm water, and the frog automatically will, will jump out. So that sense of urgency is critical. Whatever it is, in some countries, it might be climate change. In others, it might be obesity crisis. In others, it might be the gap between the haves and the have-nots. There might be many reasons. In, in each city, is going to be different. Each country is going to be different. But nevertheless, developing a sense of urgency is important. Okay, we don't want to be cooked. <laughs> Let's uh, have a question yes. from the audience. Uh, I have a question about public space, um, since it's often discussed with streets and um, squares and parks, right? But what about uh, buildings and inside public space? Since like, we had the Nolly plan before, looking at churches as public space. Do you have any ideas about how to make public space available inside and in buildings? Yes, actually, we need to integrate many of those places. Even our libraries, our schools, we need to integrate inside and out so that all of a sudden, if each one of our schools become kind of like a community hub, sometimes you're going to be able to use the classrooms to play cards and socialize. Uh, maybe one day the weather is absolutely horrible. People are going to be able to walk around the hallways, and then they meet people, and then go out after uh, for coffee. But also, the people in the library are going to help take care of the parks and the outside. So we need to have interwoven. In many ways, the, the outside place, we need to think of it as an outdoor community center and take care of it. But yes, we have, I have many cases of, for example, many religious places that have gigantic parking lots that are used just for a few hours a week. No, we need to see how to use those gigantic parking lots the other six days a week so that they can, they, they can become useful. So th th that is something that is very important. That's why I was talking about the schools, but the same happened with the schools or the churches or the libraries and so on. We need to help and, and, and be interwoven both the public place outdoor as well as private that can be used as public space so, such as religious areas. I think both Colin and Gil will be able to stay for a while. Yes, Maybe, I, I, as long as you want. Uh, this is fantastic and I want to thank you for this but keep in mind all of these changes do all and I'm being very selfish when I tell you that I want the Swedish cities to do better. <laughs> Don't be complacent because a simple thing, concepts such as Vision Zero, 
all of a sudden you are saving lives all over the world because people are paying attention. They say, oh, those Swedish, they're so strange, but look, they came up with this idea of vision zero and people are copying what you have done. So do not be complacent. For example, cycling in most Swedish cities is very, is very mediocre. If you compare with Copenhagen or with own a big city or with owns a small city, it mo you can improve a lot. But the, w the more and more than the cities in Sweden improve, you are helping all other cities in the world because everybody's watching. What do you do? How do you plant the trees? What is the height of the buildings? What is the relationship of the immigrants? They, how do they get incorporated into society? So the good and the bad. So do not become complacent. Do not fall into this myth of excellence because all of a sudden this magazine X or Y says that you are the best. No, you got to do better. You are very, very good. Thank but you. But you can improve. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic.